child, there was one particular Bible story I really struggled with. How could God be so quick-tempered to kill a man for trying to do good and help him? You all know the story of Uzzah, who put out his hand to stop the ark from falling, and God struck him dead on the spot. Now, years later, I think I have a better grasp of the entire story and a greater understanding of God's character and why God did what he did. Many people struggle with what appears to be the harshness of God in the Old Testament. So this morning, I thought it was worthwhile re-evaluating the story together. So let's start by looking at the setting. David has just become king of both Israel and Judah, and he'd made Jerusalem his new capital city, moving it from Hebron in the south to somewhere more central. David loved God. He wanted God at the centre of his nation. So David decided that the Ark of the Covenant should be brought to Jerusalem from the town of kiriath Jearim, where it had been left, unused in the worship of his nation for about a hundred years. Let's track back and find out what the Ark was doing in kiriath Jearim. Well, approximately a hundred years previously, Israel had been fighting the Philistines, and it soon became apparent that the Philistines would win. Someone came up with a bright idea. Let's take the ark into battle. The Israelites figured if they had the ark with them on the battlefront, then God would be there too. Unfortunately for Israel, God stayed home that day. In the battle, Eli's two sons were killed, after which Eli himself died. Israel were guilty of using God as a lucky charm when they needed him, but ignoring him when they didn't. Mm. The Philistines slaughtered Israel's army and took the ark back home with them to the city of Ashdod, as a trophy of war. Now, you display a trophy in a prominent place, don't you? So the Philistines placed the ark in the temple of their god, Dagon, a god who was half a man and half a fish, as a way of declaring that their god was greater than the god of Israel. The next morning, their god lay face down on the temple floor. So they picked up the statue of Dagon and placed him back where he belonged. They offered their sacrifices to Dagon and went home again. The next morning they found Dagon on the floor again. But he wasn't lying on his face this time. He didn't have a face anymore. His head and his hands had been broken off and were laying on the threshold beside him. When God had finished with Dagon, he started on the people of Ashdod, and he plagued them with huge tumours and rats. So severe was the outbreak that the people of Ashdod were terrified and decided it was time to share their trophy of war with the other great Philistine cities. So the ark was shuffled from city to city in Philistia, and everywhere it was taken, those cities were plagued by these tumours and rats. Finally, the Philistines had had enough and decided to return the ark back to Israel with all the respect this powerful God deserved. They decided the best way to do this was to put it on a new ox cart along with a chest of golden offerings five golden tumours and five golden rats. This was a peace offering to honour the God of Israel. The Philistines then chose two cows who were feeding very young calves 
to pull the ark, cart containing the ark and they set them loose. The cows then did a miraculous thing. They left their babies and headed straight to Israel, although they mooed and lowed all the way along the road. You can find the whole story in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now I've recapped because I want you to notice this and remember. The Philistines handled the ark. They put it on an ox cart and no harm came to them. We'll come back to that point. The ark on the ox cart arrived in Israel at Beth Shemesh, where the people were delighted to have the ark in their city. A crowd gathered and gawked at it. Then they opened it to view its sacred contents, the Ten Commandments, pot of manna and Aaron's rod. Seventy people were killed by God on the spot. And this really upset the people of Beth Shemesh. So they had the ark moved to Kiriath Jearim. And there it remained for the next 100 years or so until David decided to bring it to Jerusalem. And this, of course, brings us to our story today. We know the ark came to Kiriath Jerim to the house of a man by the name of Abinadab, who was a Levite. Abinadab had three sons. Their names were Eliezer, Ahio, and Uzzah. These three boys grew up around the ark in their home, and they were blessed because the ark was in their home. They cared for and understood that the presence of God rested on the ark. My research indicates that by the time David wanted to move the ark, both Abinadab and Eliezer had died, and it is recorded that the only family members to accompany the ark on the journey were Ahio and Uzzah. Now, David wanted the ark in Jerusalem, his capital city, so the ark was placed on an ox cart. The oxen pulling the cart stumbled and the ark slid and was about to fall to the ground and then something went horribly wrong. Uzzah reached up and steadied the ark and he is immediately struck dead by God. Why? What did he do that was so wrong? David didn't know. He halted the procession of the ark. You can read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 8. And it says this, David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. The Hebrew word used here describes David as hot, furious, incensed. This shouldn't have happened. It says he became afraid and had no idea how he would ever get the ark to Jerusalem. He decided not to move the ark any further, but instead had it carried over to the house of Obed-Edom, another Levite, where it remained until they could figure out what they had done wrong. Well, what had gone wrong? The Bible tells us in verse 7, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. His irreverent act? What had he done wrong? The Philistines had handled the ark. If we read the clear instructions God gave the children of Israel and recorded by Moses in Numbers 4, we know that only the Kohathites, one particular family in the tribe of Levi, were allowed to carry the ark. And Numbers 4.6 tells us 
that even they were told that they must not touch the holy things or they will die. <coughs> but if they couldn't touch the ark, how were the Kohathites supposed to move it? God had given very specific instructions about how the holy things were to be treated when the Israelite camp had to be moved. How God chose Levite families for specific jobs, even down to those who were to carry the tent poles. This morning, we are only concerned with the transportation of the ark, which was an elaborate box covered with gold, and along each side there were rings that were designed to hold the carrying poles, and only the Kohathites could carry it by this means. But when David and the Israelites decided to take the ark into Jerusalem, they didn't carry it that way. They weren't using poles to carry it with. They had put it up on a new ox cart and were wheeling it down the road. So, we have remembered the Philistines could handle the ark and transport it incorrectly. God didn't strike any of them dead because they knew no better. I believe God is making it very clear that if you know how you should live and behave and then choose not to, God will hold you accountable for that knowledge. Now, <coughs> think about this with me for a minute. If you couldn't move the ark safely without poles being in the rings, and if you couldn't touch the ark without dying, how do you suppose they got the ark onto the cart? There is no record of anyone dying earlier in the story. I think they used the poles. They knew. They knew they had to use the poles to move the ark, and yet, they still decided to move the ark by ox cart. Why would they do that? I think it was easier. Kiriath Jerem was about 10 miles west of Jerusalem. Imagine having four men carry a heavy box with poles on their shoulders 10 miles. Wouldn't it be so much easier to put it on a cart and let oxen do the work? Of course it would have. So then I began to think, could that happen to us? Yes, it really could. Taking the easy route is not always the best choice. Walking with God can seem like hard work. It's so much easier to do my Christianity on a part-time basis. It's easier to choose to ride along than walk along. It takes time to pray. It's much easier to allow a preacher to pray for us. It takes time to study the Bible. It's much easier to take the preacher's word for it. If all I do is ride along, it's not my faith, it's someone else's. The easy way robs me of the closeness to God I really need and want. And if I do it long enough, my faith dies. The second point that came to me, apart from it being easier, was what about accepting the thinking of men over clear commands of God? I think that's always been the downfall for Christians for centuries. The church has too often had the tendency to combine the teachings and traditions of men 
with the pure word of God. When David and the Israelites chose the easy way to worship God, they chose to follow the example of the Philistines rather than God's word. The results were devastating. Make sure you stick to God's word and God's word only. <coughs> now another question that came to my mind, did the Israelites really know how to treat the ark? You will find this story in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, and I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles 13, 1 to 3. You do need to do quite a bit of research along the different books. But 1 Chronicles 13, 1 to 3 says this. David conferred with each of his officers. If it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our brothers throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests <coughs> and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. You see, David had actually given this a lot of thought and prayer. That was why he was so angry with God when Uzzah died. This was not some haphazard adventure he was embarking on. He consulted people. He asked everyone he knew. He even made sure that the priests and the Levites were on hand. There are 30,000 people on hand for this event. Surely someone would have thought to look at what Moses had written about how the ark should be moved before they moved it. Now, who had been brought up in a godly home caring for the ark? Of course, Uzzah. He did know better. Uzzah had forgotten who God really was. He had grown familiar. He thought he was looking after God, not that God was looking after him. The lesson I think for us here is that we have access to God, but we must never be casual and treat him with familiarity. We may boldly approach God, but always with reverence, remembering who he is. So I ask myself the question, is it possible that we can behave like Uzzah in the way that we casually regard the sacred? Do we come to church expecting to be entertained? <coughs> And I asked myself, what is it that causes a person to forsake the rules and do what they want to do? I think it is something called comfortability or your comfort zone. Comfort killed Uzzah because he was so comfortable with his role that he forgot who God was. His comfort and complacency cost him his life. <coughs> Question. Can we become so comfortable here in church that we become complacent? F.B. Mayer, in one of his commentaries, said this. The one thing that pierces the heart of God with unutterable grief is not the world's iniquity, but the church's indifference. Complacency is a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often 
while unaware of some potential danger or defect. Complacency can lead to self-satisfaction. We must be on our guard against complacency in the Christian life. We must never be content thinking we have done enough in serving God. We must never think it won't matter if we don't read our Bible for a day or miss church for a while. Because what happens in one day easily becomes two, then a week, a month. And before you know it, it is easier not to do them than it is to get back to spending that time with God. It is hard not to notice that while God does not tolerate others' action, he tolerates David's anger. David's anger did not get him killed. David learned an important lesson during his three months reflection. He thought his public worship and praise was enough for God. He thought his excitement and enthusiasm would satisfy God. But God is holy. God does not change. His law does not change. God requires obedience too. Three months later, David completed the task. And this time, with obedience. We read that David danced before the Lord with all his might, accompanied by shouts and the sound of trumpets. David proclaimed a psalm of thanks, and in his praise, David says this. He is to be feared, and advises all the earth to tremble before him. I think this is wise counsel. Consider Uzzah, who became too comfortable and familiar with God, that he thought he could do things his way. So let's wrap up this sad story by just enumerating three important points. It was recorded so that we can learn from their mistakes. One, we cannot make our own shortcuts or take an easy route into the kingdom of God. Two, never disregard any specific command of God that you are aware of. Three, never be so comfortable with Almighty God that you forget reverence. May we learn the lesson of Uzzah and always give God the obedience, reverence and praise that belong to him. Amen.